Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Geet Dugal. I'm a developer at DNA Nexus. And um, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, a lot of the people in the open source community I work with, I basically think everyone I know is here. So it's my first time here, and I, I really like it. And I'm, I'm looking forward to coming back to more Bosks. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about um, strategy and best practices of running uh, portable workflow and container specifications uh, in uh, the cloud. And, I'm trying uh, to make this uh, not very specific to DNA Nexus. A lot of the lessons that we've learned, I feel, are applicable to virtually any uh, cloud implementation. So you could imagine doing something kind of a DIY approach on AWS Batch, and these same um, uh, practices would apply. So I'm going to start out with uh, saying that I think we have uh, entered an era where, um, at first, we were in a wild west of workflow uh, language uh, executors and container specifications. And um, while not everyone is lining up uh, to use CWL Whittle and Docker, we've seen from our customer base uh, a, a dramatically increased uh, interest and in many times even intent to use um, these representations. Uh, so, like as you saw from Farah's talk earlier, there was like over 215 ways to execute your workflows, and I do think that that is the natural thing. Is like I have to execute a workflow. Let me just kind of whip up my own way of doing it, or work with a system that has their representation. Uh, but in the past few years, I think these uh, three languages have provided a lot of uh, or representations have provided a lot of value to the community. And uh, what I hope uh, that you all get out of this talk is. Um, if you are writing in one of these uh, representations, uh, what are some of the best practices for uh, writing the workflows so that they're reusable and scale in the cloud? Um, and towards the end, uh, I'll cover a few, uh, what I feel are a few useful properties of uh, execution environments as seen uh, by our customers to run at production scales. And finally, I have a, a couple of thoughts on where we can go from here, and um, uh, that'll be the end. So, uh, what do I mean at scale? Uh, just for the purposes of this talk, uh, just imagine uh, uh, multiple organizations, each processing potentially tens of thousands of genomes or hundreds of thousands of exomes. So that's the scale uh, that we want to be able to run portable workflows in the cloud. So uh, this is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek kind of claim here, but I'll, uh, I'll make the argument that in terms of representing a workflow in a way that's portable, re reproducible, and reusable. Uh, CWL, Whittle, and Docker, I think, have, have done a good job of uh, effectively solving that problem. I mean, there's definitely a lot of work we're going to keep doing in, in that realm. But the representation part, I think, is, is, is well solved. But where we need to do a little bit um, more work is, now that we have these representations, uh, uh, how do we execute them? And what's that experience like uh, in different environments? So to give you an idea of these different environments, uh, a local environment is um, you know, what I call like airplane mode uh, development, where you're on a flight and you want to work on a workflow. Uh, here you have everything on your laptop. So you're going to have a Docker installation on your laptop, some CWL or Whittle runner, or if you have some other system. And then you basically just do all the testing you want right on your laptop. Uh, uh, no extra resources needed. Uh, to contrast, a very common development environment um, is a high performance uh, cluster system, where you have uh, a, a rack of computers. Uh, that rack of computers could be just like physically near you, or it could be uh, in, in one of the common uh, cloud providers. Uh, and uh, you have a CWL or Whittle orchestrator and a bunch of uh, uh, Docker containers running to run the tasks. Uh, and, and here the key idea is, is that um, you're always thinking in terms of a fixed set of resources for which you are optimizing um, where you want to uh, uh, run these tasks and how you pack those tasks in that uh, fixed set of resources. To contrast, uh, when we think of uh, cloud uh, development and running workflows in the cloud, the key difference is um, they're trying to abstract away this idea that you're living in a fixed set of resources. So when I ask the cloud for a CPU or I ask the cloud for storage, all I have to do is wait a little bit, and theoretically, I can use it as much as I, I want, as, as, as long as I'm willing to pay. Um, uh, if, there are limitations even in the cloud, but um, uh, for practical purposes, it's basically uh, infinite. Um, so in that model, um, uh, you actually have a cost to pay to request CPU and file resources. 
Um, and so what I want to do is kind of break down the three in terms of expectations in each environment as well as uh, limitations. Uh, so uh, uh, as we were uh, talking about in the local environment, you can quickly access all your CPUs and files. Uh, but the, the downside is, is that you, you have limited sample sizes. And these are typically unrealistic uh, test situations when you're just running on a, like a toy BAM or, or a FASTA file. Um, uh, in a cluster, uh, you do still have quick-ish access to all your CPUs and files. Uh, so you might have a little bit of a delay of scheduling your job in the cluster or um, uh, a delay from a network file system. But you can still access your files pretty fast. And now you get the benefit of operating on uh, realistic sample sizes. Uh, but often you're working in a world where you're, you're thinking in terms of fixed resources. You may try to come up with some mechanisms to auto-scale your cluster. Uh, but you have issues with the idea that you have fixed resources. And we've noticed in many cases that like uh, shared uh, file systems can often be a bottleneck and even slow down uh, wall clock time of workflow e execution. Um, so uh, in the cloud, you kind of have this idea of, of limitless scalability and collaboration across regions and all these kind of uh, buzzwords. Um, but the big price you're paying in the cloud is that there's some time to pay to get one of these resources. Um, and uh, I will make a little note there that uh, the cloud resources are becoming, uh, wh whether you're layered on top of the cloud or the cloud providers themselves, are becoming a lot better at making these requests faster. You can, you know, lambdas are a lot faster than uh, requesting a traditional instance type. Uh, but the time is still significant enough to where uh, I would argue that it makes a difference in your perception of how the workflow is executed. Um, so what I'm going to argue in this talk is that if you follow these three-ish best practices for writing workflows, you just keep them in the back of your head, um, then whether you re, you know, you're developing it on an airplane or in your local cluster, you're going to be uh, much better off when you're uh, ready to scale up to the cloud. So the first best practice is, uh, I'm going to illustrate it with this uh, sort of simple ex example. It, it looks like a a typical Unix, pipe, Unix pipeline, you're doing a grep and a cut and a sort. And typically, you just pipe the data through there. Um, but now, let's imagine that same pipeline on the uh, cloud. On the left, I have an idealized kind of representation of that pipeline, where um, uh, it's the most granular uh, you can do it. And um, on the arrows and the thickness represent the amount of data that's flowing through that pipeline. Um, so here, if you would put this directly on the cloud, it's clear that no one actually does this, but um, if you were actually to do that, you would, um, you would be paying computational costs for every step, and you would also be transferring a lot of data back and forth to the cloud. Um, so one approach might be, well, I just want to minimize doing all of that in the cloud, so why don't I just put this, you know, cram that all into one big computational unit? Well, the problem with that is, is that um, it's one reason why the cloud is handy is that you, have, uh, you can keep data around and you can reuse the, that data later. You can inspect it. If you want to look at the intermediate results of a, a workflow, if you can imagine this being a more complicated bioinformatics pipeline, you can do that. So I think one of the challenges is um, when you're developing a workflow is that you want to minimize your wall clock time, but you also want to maximize your reusability and granularity. And um, as Brad uh, Chapman said yesterday, no talk comes without a mention of machine learning. If someone wants to solve this problem with machine learning, that'd be great. Uh, but I don't, uh, I don't have a solution yet. So right now, we kind of have to keep this in mind when, when designing our workflows. Uh, if you design it in such a way that it makes sense in this context, um, uh, you'll probably be better off when you run in the cloud. For the second best practice, um, I'd like to take a look at that same pipeline. But now if you look at this uh, dotted line I have around the workflow, um, it's just doing something very simple. It's, purposely uh, black boxing the idea of the workflow. Um, uh, this being said, a lot of different execution environments, including our own, uh, allow you to uh, provide parameters to stages within the workflow. And um, so even though you've defined it as a workflow, this workflow, say, has just one input, you can still modify parameters to many different stages in the workflow. And sometimes this is uh, not only desirable, but even in some cases, I don't want to say unavoidable, but you um, uh, you, you definitely uh, want to keep being able to do that. That being said, um, if you can, uh, uh, we feel that if you design your workflows to be uh, all of the inputs are just 
uh, moved up into the uh, black box kind of stage. You're not really thinking about your workflow in terms of stages. It's going to be much easier to understand as you sc uh, scale up and use it in other contexts. And, um, uh, and it's going to be more modular and reusable across uh, different environments. So the, the best practice there is think of uh, your uh, workflow I.O. as greater than the sum of all of your task I.O.s. Uh, and another way to think about this is that when you design a workflow, you're designing it to differentiate it from all the steps within it. It's, it's got to have a, a sort of utility on its own that, that can be modularly used in other uh, contexts. So for the final best practice, I'd like to kind of focus on a uh, few key features of CWL, Whittle, and Docker that, that um, uh, I've come across. So, First is this idea of file system encapsulation. So Docker actually does a lot of things because you know, it has a, a, a presence in the, the larger software engineering world. Uh, but for the case of running bioinformatics workflows, I think its main purpose is just saying, here's a bunch of files, here's a bunch of dependencies, here's the script I want to run, and here's how they're all organized. And that's basically it. So that's what Docker is really providing for us. Um, CWL and Whittle provide you the ability to make task and tool definitions that then run in those Docker containers, and you can specify the dependencies between these tasks and tools. And uh, especially as of uh, recently, there's been a, a much more focus on doing kind of conditional execution of parts of workflows uh, at the CWL and uh, Whittle layers. Um, so um, these are what I would call the kind of core features of the language. Uh, other than that, you know, they're not, they're not trying to do too much more. Uh, however, uh, both languages do provide some um, what I call handy features. And a lot of these are encompassed in, in what I call workflow level processing tasks. So the red boxes to the right indicate uh, basically uh, things that you would do while uh, pre-processing inputs or post-processing outputs to get maybe data in the right format um, or uh, potentially something a bit more complicated. Uh, in some cases, these little red boxes can execute arbitrary uh, code. Uh, so, um, you could imagine a few models for actually executing these workflows, um, whether you're locally or in a more cloud setting. On the left, uh, I have a little uh, circle with the four red boxes all in there. So that, what that represents is the orchestrator for running this workflow will run all, the, uh, all of the workflow level tasks in, in that unit. Um, uh, the, to contrast that, on the right, um, you, uh, all of those workflow level processing tasks are kind of broken up uh, by, by their own, uh, into their own tasks. And um, at DNA Nexus, we sort of follow this model because um, what we want to do is make sure that our workflow engine uh, doesn't have the opportunity to execute arbitrary code and um, you could take down parts of our system. So what we do is we, our compiler will actually break apart the, these uh, uh, workflow elements into their own tasks. And we've worked on ways to optimize running those efficiently. However, you'll see that this kind of contrasts with the first best practice, where I'm saying don't try to create too many of these tasks, because each of those is a computational request cost. Um, so um, I, I think one thing that uh, if, if, if you want to kind of assume the, the worst case where every one of these is going to be its own uh, computational request cost is if you treat any workflow level processing you're doing as tasks, that helps to better frame in mind like maybe some things you're doing at the workflow level are really better just encoded in your Docker container in your tasks, um, whereas other things are just a little bit more like a quick data uh, manipulation that is best represented at the workflow level. Um, so finally, I wanted to cover a few desirable features of an execution environment that make running hundreds of thousands of exomes um, actually doable. And the top three, I think, um, uh, are, uh, and so Farha covered this very well in terms of uh, uh, having an open source kind of view of it, is full provenance tracking is very important. When you have multiple users collaborating on a big project, uh, every one of them wants to be able to see what's actually happened and what's the history and be able to track down all the log files and everything that's uh, generated in an easy way. Um, Automatic restarts are also key, especially for like the scatter part of running batch jobs. A lot of times jobs in the cloud just fail because of minor, tiny failures. And um, just restarting them will um, uh, make them run uh, 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 fine. And finally, this applies more to gather steps. Uh, reusability is, is really key. 
we have some workflows where the gather step is uh, themselves itself an entire workflow. And um, in this case, uh, if that just fails for some simple reason, you just need to tweak it and modify it, having the ability to reuse everything that you've computed up to that point, because it can take long, is very valuable. Um, also, I wanted to mention that in, in our environment, we have the idea that a workflow or app is like an executable. Uh, so like, just like a C program compiles to an executable, it's similar for apps and workflows. And um, in this way, when you're in a more production environment, and at some point you don't care about the source, you just care about reusing your workflow on lots of data, versioning and pub publishing and collaborating at the executable level uh, makes a bit more sense. Uh, so with my uh, last apparent minute, um, uh, some thoughts going forward. So one thing that uh, we found very valuable, and I definitely want to continue this, is uh, the dream challenges, I think, were a great way of getting the community together. A bunch of different execution environments, a bunch of different practical workflows. And um, by all of us getting together and running them, we actually see where are these pain points, uh, especially if you want to run bigger workflows uh, or in the future with more, more samples. Um, and I think this also naturally leads to improvements to the representations. So like one example I can think of is sometimes you just want to access like a little slice of a BAM file, but it might be more efficient to do that remotely. So if you have a uh, language level representation of a uh, HTTP file URL so that the developer knows that I can do any HTTP file operation, uh, that could be something uh, helpful. And finally, I think um, this is covered also very well in Farha's talk. Uh, we, uh, in our uh, platform, we have the concept of a project. And the project contains all of your provenance, all of your files, and your workflows and, and apps. And that's a really core unit of, of sort of sharing uh, for our platform. And I think having that in a portable environment would be really great because um, you know, I could be on my laptop develop, like the vision would be is I'm in my laptop, I'm developing a workflow, I'm testing on small examples. Uh, I can then say, you know, import into my HPC plus cluster, import into the cloud, and I can use uh, uh, that and more sophisticated tools to interrogate um, the, the runs that I've performed. So um, that's it. I really appreciate your uh, time and um, look forward to more BOSCs. <laughs>